Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Husbands are to love their wives. Not even an amen from the ladies. Husbands are to love their wives. That's what the Bible tells us. In fact, the standard by which a husband is to love his wife is set very high. The, the, the goal of a husband is to love his wife in the same way that Christ loves the church. Now, we, we look at this passage before us this morning, and when we understand the depth of a husband's love, when we compare, it can only be compared to that between Christ and the church, then we know, fellas, we need to get this right. In, in fact, last Sunday, we looked at verse number 25 where he says, Husbands, love your wives even as, just as, the Bible tells us, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, or he gave himself up for it. So we know that a husband's love for his wife ought to be selfless. Notice on the screen, Matthew 20, 28. Uh, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. We can certainly learn from the example of the Lord there that, that our goal is not that we might be served, but that we might serve. But then, not only is love selfless, but that kind of love is also sacrificial. As Christ, he also became a ransom for us. He gave his life a ransom for many. We see here in our passage before us in verse 25 that he gave himself up for the church. So it is a selfless love. It is a sacrificial love as he gave himself up for us. We, we could go all throughout the Bible and read about God's love. Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth or proved or demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us or what about John 3:16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son or what about 1 John 4:9 in this was manifested the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him we can read about God's love and his grace and all of these things and that very word is the basic summarization of the husband. His role, number one, is to love. The most basic job description, the most basic function, the most basic role of a husband towards his wife is to love her. Amen? Feel free, ladies, to say amen this morning. Uh, and if, if every once in a while you need to, if I hear a man go, oh, that's because you just ribbed him uh, with your elbow. Uh, but but that's, this is a very important passage this morning because we're talking about the depth of the love that a husband is to have for his wife. You say, well, you know what? I love my wife, but I don't love her the way I think I should, or I don't love her as deep as the love that Christ has for the church. Let me, let me just read this passage for you on the screen, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. You get the idea that, that you can grow in your love. The Lord can help you. The Lord can make you to increase and abound in your love toward your wife. You say, well, how do I do that? How do I love my wife in the same way that Christ loves the church? Well, if you feel like, well, I'm not really there yet, here's, here's the goal, grow spiritually. The more you grow in the word, the more you grow in grace, the more you grow in your relationship with God, the greater your love for each other. Amen? So that's the key for me, being a better husband, is by being a better Christian. The key to me, being a better follower of Jesus Christ, then will, will produce the right kind of relationship. Because you have Christ's very nature, if, you were, if you're born again, you have Christ's very nature, and it is through him, as his love is in you, can flow through you, you are able to love more and more. That's the truth. Now, this morning, as we're in chapter 5, we're coming to the end of the second section of Ephesians. And, of course, we started a few weeks ago. We talked about wives submitting yourselves to your own husbands. And then, of course, last Sunday, husbands love 
your wives. So we're talking about relationships between a husband and a wife. We'll finish this next Sunday. Uh, in, the la- in fact, we'll finish chapter 5, Lord willing, next Sunday. And then we'll talk about the relationship between children and their parents. And then, of course, between employers and employees. And we'll see that uh, in the next several weeks. But this morning, I'd like for us to understand from, from the Word of God the depth or to understand the deeper look that Paul gives to the husband in how he is to treat his wife. Three things this morning, but before we get into them, let's go to him in a word of prayer. Now, Father, I pray today, Lord, as difficult of a passage as this is for us husbands, we understand that this is the standard for which we must strive. Lord, that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Lord, I say it's only difficult because if we are dealing with our pride, Lord, if we're dealing with our own selfish desires and ambitions, it is hard. But Lord, if we submit ourselves to you, Lord, if we are a loyal, devoted follower of Jesus Christ, Lord, then this passage is not that complicated. So, Father, I pray now that you'll bless the reading of your word, bless our time together in it, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Notice, first of all, we see that it is a purifying love. Number one, it is a purifying love. We see verse 26. Now, of course, this goes right in hand with what he just said in verse 25, that husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Notice this now, and gave himself up for it. He gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The reason that he gave up himself for the church is that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Now, the word sanctify, uh, it, it's a word that we don't commonly use in everyday language. When was the last time you went to a coffee shop or to the grocery store uh, and you said to the person behind you, Are you sanctified? Or uh, I'm going to order a sanctified latte, right? We don't use that word in our everyday language because, I mean, it is a Bible word. And and we understand that sanctification, we know that it is a process. It is the ongoing process of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. However, the word sanctify in its most broadest basic meaning simply means to set apart. To set something apart for the purpose or the priority uh, of, uh, of, of something in particular. And that's what sanctification is. It is the, really the idea of holiness. You realize that when you came to Christ, He forgave you completely. Amen? When you came to Christ, He forgave you immediately, but He sanctifies you continually. Notice Isaiah 1.18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That speaks of forgiveness. Notice the next one, Micah. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of of the seed. Jeremiah 31, 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me for that, for the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And then Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Aren't you glad that when you came to Christ that you were you were cleansed, you were forgiven immediately and permanently. Amen. That that your sin as far as the east is from the west, that God will remember them no more. And this is what happens when you got saved that you were totally cleansed. Now, we have been forgiven all of our sins, past, present, future, but do we still sin? Yes. You would say, well, wait a minute. If all of our sins have already been forgiven, do we still need to ask for forgiveness? Yes. Here's here's the reason. 
Because you, you cannot, you say, well, why do I need to ask forgiveness if, if God already forgave me of all of our sins? Let me, let me take you to an example in John chapter 13. You remember after they had celebrated the, the Passover meal together and Jesus said, I'm about to do something that you're not going to understand right now, but later you'll get it. Jesus gets up, washes the disciples' feet, and you know the story, and he comes to Peter, and Peter's like, no, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. You remember what Jesus said? Well, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you're, gonna, you're not going to have any part with me. Well, Lord, in that case, wash my head and my hand. Lord, give me a bath. But then notice carefully what he says in John 13. Jesus say unto him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit or everywhere. And you are clean, but not all. What did Jesus say there? Peter, he that is cleansed needs only to wash his feet. When you got saved, you were cleansed. See, when you got saved, you were sanctified. He, he, he forgave you. And, of course, through the process of sanctification, think about it this way. We live in this world, and as we live in this world, we go from day to day, and we walk in the muck, in the mire, in the dust of the world. We need to wash our feet, so to speak. We need to do this as part of the sanctification that we are cleansing our, we've been cleansed thoroughly, but Jesus says, you don't need to take another bath, you just need to wash your feet. Think about this, notice 1 John 1, 9, this is what it looks like. If we confess our sins, he's talking to the church, he's talking to believers. Obviously they're saved, and he says here, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, yes, all of our sins are forgiven positionally. We know that there's nothing we can do if we truly are born again, part of this family, that we can be unsaved. We are, we are positionally, everything's okay. But we still need to wash our feet, amen? We still need to confess our sins, that's important. Ray Stedman, of course, you know the idea of confession is that you are agreeing with God. So you cannot go throughout life, well, you know, it doesn't matter. I've already, you know, my sins have already been forgiven, uh, so I don't have to say anything to God. He, he's already forgiven me. I don't have to ask for forgiveness. Well, you, you need to confess your sins to God for, for this purpose. I want to read for you what Ray Stedman says. The, the enjoyment of our relationship with Christ is lost when we are temporarily defiled by wrongdoing in our life. We lose the enjoyment of our relationship with Him. His attitude toward us doesn't change, but our attitude toward Him changes if we have sin in our lives. That is why we must confess our sins to God. Now, what we see here is that he says in verse 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, we obviously uh, won't get into all of the baptismal regeneration. That's not biblical. He's not talking about water baptism that sanctifies you. But it is the word itself, the word of God, that is the agent that cleanses. Notice here. Uh, John 15, 3. Now, Jesus says to his disciples, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then notice John 17, 17. Sanctify them through what? Thy truth. Thy word is truth. Psalm 119, I don't have it on the screen for you, but, but write these down. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 9 through 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word is the cleansing agent of sanctification. 
Now think about how this applies to marriage. Obviously, he's, he's writing this in the context of wives and husbands and the marriage, and then next Sunday we're looking at the mystery, how all of this is speaking about Christ and the church, and of course, how does this relate to husbands? So just as Christ sanctifies the church, the husband is to be sanctifying the wife. What does that actually look like? Men, it is our job to help our wives spiritually. We are the head of the home. We are to lead our families. We are to lead them spiritually. When it comes to our wife, that we are responsible. Now, every person will stand before the Lord, but as a husband, you realize that in the same way that Christ has sanctified the church, in the context of marriage, men, we need to make sure that we help our wives growing in their walk. Remember last week we talked about, and be not bitter against, or don't be harsh against your wife. We, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. 1 Peter 3, 7. Now, this is what a husband does for his wife. MacArthur writes, when a husband's love for his wife is like Christ's love for the church, he will continually seek to help purify her from any sort of defilement. He will seek to protect her from the world's contamination and protect her holiness, virtue, and purity in every way. Now, does that elevate the responsibilities of the husband? Absolutely. Secondly, it is a purposeful love. Look at verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So what is the purpose then? Well, what does he do? He sanctifies the church, the bride, and the husband sanctifies his bride. Notice here that he might present it to himself. In ancient times, this was very interesting reading. In ancient times, you can see several examples even in Scripture, but a, a wife would go through a process to prepare herself, every bride-to-be, to prepare themselves for the groom. An example of this is found in Esther chapter 2, verse 12. Notice what it says. Now, when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that, she had been 12 months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. But then in ancient Greece, we, you can read that there was a ceremonial bath. Every woman that was about to get married, every bride-to-be, a woman would go down to the river and bathe herself. She would bathe herself ceremonially speaking. She did this as a ceremonial cleansing in that, watch this now, when she bathed in that water, she was, whatever defilement from the past is now washed away. Ceremonially speaking, when she bathed herself with water at the river, she is presenting herself now to her husband that the past is now gone, that the, any defilement from the past is irrelevant. Now she is presenting herself to her husband holy and without blemish. I mean, I don't think you need to really think too hard about that, Brother Tom, to know how that applies to us today. Notice Colossians chapter 1. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and reprovable, unreprovable in his sight. We think about the significance of that bath, the water, what it does as he sanctifies so that he can present it to himself, a glorious church. What a beautiful picture of Christ and his bride, the church, just as a husband or wife would do that for her husband. So are we. A marriage is a lot like that. But then I want you to notice in, in, in verse number 27 that he might present to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 
Now, even though a wife would go through that process of purification to present herself to the groom, watch this now, the emphasis is still on the groom. That, that, that we are pre to present ourselves to the bridegroom, to, to Christ. Watch this carefully because what we find here is that the example is that it is the husband that sets the temperature. It is the husband that sets the thermostat. Now, I grew up in a home where there's a plaque. My mother's here today. I told her that the only thing I would ever want from her is a little plaque that hung on her wall growing up that said, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You know what? Contrary to that quote, it is not the wife or the mother that sets the tone for the home. Did you know this? It is the husband, the father. Why, Pastor Aaron and I were having a conversation this week about why men are not stepping up to fulfill their biblical role as a husband? Why are they lax in their responsibilities in the spiritual leadership and direction of the home? We do see it more common where the mother or the wife, she's the one that is navigating the family. That is not her job, really. And I think the reason is we're glad to let them do that. But you know what? The Board of God says it is a husband. Husbands, you're the one who are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. We see in the previous verses that, that the husband is the head of the home, even as Christ the church. So it is our job to lead our families if we love this way. May I challenge you men to remember that you set the temperature of love and forgiveness and sanctification. It is what Christ does for the church. It is what the husband does for the wife. Then notice thirdly, we see it is a practical love. I don't know of any wife in the room or watching today that would not get excited about these two verses. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So this is where it gets very practical. Husband says, well, I don't really know how to love my wife. Yes, you do. You love her the way you love yourself. You would take care of her as you would take care of yourself. You would, you would certainly protect yourself from harm or danger. You protect your wife from harm or danger. When you feel like, you know, I just need to be pampered. Think about that your wife needs to be pampered. Amen, ladies? I didn't hear any amen, I just heard laughter. Husbands, love your wives as you love your own bodies. Whatever you would do for yourself, do for her. When you understand that your wife is an extension of yourself, you'll understand then that it, when you respond to her the right way, when you, when you love her this way, of taking care of her just as you would care for yourself, and remember, we'll see it next week, that, that the two become one flesh. But when you care for her in this way, it brings about an appropriate response from the wife. Now watch this. It is common for a man to say, you know what, I would love my wife more if she would reciprocate or submit to me, if, if she were to love me or, or do what I say, if she would submit to me, I would be more motivated to love her. You know, I, I look at the Bible, Vaughn, and I don't see that there is a prerequisite to a wife or husband loving his wife. No, irrelevant, irregardless of a wife's role, if she's not submitting to her husband, that does not nullify the man's responsibility. You know why? Because the Bible says, husbands, love your wives. I will tell you, and this is, this is a lesson that, that we need to learn, guys. If we will love our wife this way, the way Christ loved the church, and that we realize that, that we are to help in their spiritual growth and care for our wives as we would care for our own bodies, when your wife sees that kind of love displayed towards her, 
she is going to respond the same way. She is going to respond, and you and she will submit, and guess what? Many other wonderful things. But it does start with a husband. Now, don't think, ladies, well, I'm off the hook. I'm just going to wait until my husband starts loving me. Well, that's not what the Word of God says either. We'll get into that. However, we, it is a practical love. Notice verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. See, as, as, as men, we have a sense of our well-being. You know, when, when we're thirsty, we like to get a drink. When we're, when we're hungry, we'll get something to eat. When we're cold, we'll put something warmer on. I mean, maybe some, some guys like to, to, uh, to, to take vitamins. Some guys uh, like to, uh, to work out. Uh, whatever things that we would do to take care of our own well-being, fellows, we need to understand that we are to take care and have a sense of her well-being. This is what we do as, as, as good men, as godly husbands, that just, you know, just as you would take care of your own self and have a good sense of your well-being, a good husband ensures the well-being of their wife. He desires to meet the needs of his wife. So he, watch this now, nourisheth and cherishes it, even as the Lord of the church that you are nourishing and cherishing your wife, even as the Lord of the church. Gary Smalley, who wrote many books on marriages and relationships, said this, quote, After interviewing hundreds of wives and daughters, there is one consistent plea that is commonly asked by all of these women, and it is this, Please be comforting instead of always lecturing and criticizing. He goes on to say, in fact, it's so important that Gary Smalley says, the women's eyes light up with just the thought of their husbands learning this responsibility. You know, as men, we can be dictators and, and harsh and strong and bold, but you remember when we go all the way back to the last several weeks of Ephesians 5, it is not that the husband is to be the dominant force in his family. He is to be like that loving shepherd. It is about loving leadership. Remember, first of all, it is the, the foundation of love, that you are to lead by love. Loving leadership. Speaking of, of sheep, notice, and I love what, this week as I was studying for this sermon, I, I came across Isaiah 40, verse 11. Notice what it says, and I love the parallel that we can take for marriage. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. See, a good shepherd will love his sheep, will feed his sheep, will protect his sheep, he will gather his lambs in his arms and carry them close to his heart. He will provide gentle leadership. Think about, men, your job, just as Christ is the good shepherd. Think about, in fact, even 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, Peter talks to, about him as the chief shepherd. But using that uh, analogy of Christ, who is the shepherd, as he leads the church, that we as husbands are to be gentle shepherds leading our wives and leading our families. Do you ever imagine a, a, a shepherd mistreating his sheep? If he's a good shepherd, no. There's, in fact, John chapter 10, he talks about hirelings. They don't really care about the sheep. They're only really there, you know, because they're looking for a paycheck. They're just hirelings. But a good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. Men, are you good shepherds? Are you the kind of shepherd that will draw your lambs close to your heart to protect, to provide, to love, that if necessary, lay down your life? Do you love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning with no one looking around. In the same way 
that Christ did this for the church. He laid out his life. We know that God so loved the world that he gave. If you're here this morning or watching today and you say, I don't know for sure where I will spend eternity. Can I tell you the good news? Christ died for you. And the Bible tells us that, that he died, shed his blood for you, and that he has a gift of eternal life. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're here today and you say, I don't know the good shepherd. I don't know where I stand with all of this God stuff. We would love to sit with you and talk with you and show you from the Word of God what this is all about. But if you're here this morning as a Christian husband, can I challenge you? I'm challenged. In fact, I told my wife, I said, even, even this past Tuesday, how difficult it was to be reminded that, that I need to step it up as a husband in loving my wife this way. What about you? Will you take the challenge of, the, of your obedience to the Word of God and love God this way? Love, love your wife this way? In a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation, and it is during this time. And I want to challenge you to either come forward to this altar or even at your seat where you stand to make a decision of what you're going to do in light of the Word of God. Will you apply it to your life and love your wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for it? So, Father, I do pray that you would have your will and way in all of our hearts. Father, I pray, Lord, even, even this moment, as we think about communion, the price that you paid for our sanctification, for our cleansing, and Lord, that you died for us. So, Father, I pray that we will take this opportunity, Lord, not only as we think about the love that we should have for our wives and the love that you have for us, but, Lord, that we also might prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. So, Lord, have your will and way in all of our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. Brian continues to play. Where are you at with the Lord today? Do you need to ask for cleansing, confess your sins to God, that he might forgive, cleanse you from all trespasses as we prepare our, our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper today. Please be seated. We'll have the men come forward now as we prepare for communion. And if you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, we would encourage you to partake of the Lord's table, remembering what he did for us at Calvary. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread.
when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Why don't you give the, the Lord a word of thanks? Dear Lord, thank you for this time of communion. Um, thank you for your, your body that was broken for us. Um, help us to all um, continue to remember um, what you've done and the price you paid for us. In Jesus' name, amen. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I'll ask Brother Kevin to close out our communion service in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice this past week. So we praise God for that. So let's rejoice in all that God has done uh, this past week. So Katie put together a, uh, just a little tidbit of what VBS was all about this week. Join us so far. Amen. I'll be brief. Um, first, <laughs> so first of all, happy Fourth of July weekend, uh, the weekend that we celebrate the birth of our great country. And uh, if you have been wondering, like uh, President John F. Kennedy, who said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, then I have a great idea for you. You can come back here next Sunday night at 5 o'clock uh, to hear and support Dr. Charles Shoemaker of Church Planting America. This worthy organization assists and encourages young church planters 
counseling, developing, and making resources available for young preachers and churches as they seek to birth new congregations. New Horizons Baptist Church has been supporting CPA for about 10 years, and we have no plans on stopping that. I want to read you something from their webpage. I think this is pretty cool. The hope of America does not rest with religious broadcasting, Fox News, or the emergent church movement. To address the myriad of woes gripping the hearts and minds of Americans, vibrant Bible-preaching, soul-winning churches are needed. On average, over 3,500 churches a year close their doors. We must respond to this crisis by birthing new churches, churches, will, churches that will stand firm on God's word and be a beacon of hope in a dark world. Our goal is to impact America one church at a time. So I think that's, that's pretty cool, that CPA. As I said, I don't think um, there's anything better you can do for your country than to help get the gospel out to as many as possible and to help build and establish Bible-believing churches in America. Um, so please come out next Sunday, next Sunday night at 5 o'clock. And speaking of getting the gospel out, um, thank you, New Horizons. Um, you've seen on the back of your bulletins uh, the missions giving. It's above budget, and we thank you for that. Um, you make Marcia and Rhonda and I's job really easy. Thank you. <clears throat> and so just to quickly recap, um, we have 16 full-time uh, missionaries that we support, um, including Dr. Shoemaker, um, at $100 each per month. And then we like to give extra as needs arise and as funds are available as much as possible. So we have three things um, that we ask of you. If you have any ideas of how we can improve on what we do, how to make missions a major part, major priority for this church, or how we can bring more visibility to individual missions or missionaries, um, please let us know. Marsha and Rhonda, please let us know. We'd, we'd love to have your help. We're, we're, we're all ears. Um, and oh, by the way, Brandon has put a QR code out there on the missions table. You can scan it with your phone. You can bring up the, the letters that the missionaries send us and read them. Please do that. Please read those letters and get familiar with the 16 missionaries that we do support. Uh, number two. Um, thank you, and please continue your wonderful financial support. And number three, and probably most importantly, please pray. Um, James says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer does matter. Um, and I ask you to please be deliberate with your prayers um, regarding our church and each of us individually taking our rightful part in God's program of getting the gospel and his whole word out locally and to the whole world. Now think of that for a moment. God will accomplish his glorious plans with or without our help. But in his infinite grace and mercy, he allows us to take part. And, and what a privilege that is. So as you saw the video, the VBS, we had a great time this week. VBS is in and of itself a great missionary outreach and also a fundraiser. The kids brought in over $400 or around $400. And uh, the missions fund is actually, the missions committee is matching that. So we have a check that we would like to uh, give to Sadie. And I will let Sadie tell you about what she's going to do with that money. Well, for those of you that were here for VBS or those of you that have followed us on Facebook, um, we're starting a, a mission called Be Kind, Rewind. And our goal is to spread kindness like pollen through the love of Jesus. And we have two ways of accomplishing that. And one is doing random acts of kindness for others. And the second is doing intentional acts of kindness for those who are already spreading kindness like pollen to encourage them to continue pollinating. Um, but the most important part of our mission is to do that work through the love of Jesus. And um, we want to further his kingdom and invite new worker bees to join our hive. And so I want to thank the church for rallying around us and supporting our cause and encouraging kids to collect items for our care bags. Um, this week at VBS, we collected over 1,500 items for care bags that we'll fill to pass out to homeless people in our area and uh, in our surrounding communities. Um, and I've had a few people reach out and tell me they're interested in helping more. We'd like to make this um, a bigger project in the church to have more people help out in any way that they can. Any and all are welcome. And if you would like to keep up with our progress and find opportunities to volunteer, you can follow our Facebook page, Be Kind, Rewind, B-E-E, -E, Kind, 
R-E-E, wind. Um, and we've also got, after, between um, church and growth classes, I'll be out by the missions table, if that's okay with Scott. Um, to, I have a few bottles of honey that we sold this week during BBS. That goes towards our projects and things. And <clears throat> I have a flyer also. So we've done other things as well. We've passed out Valentine's Day cards at the nursing home in town and would like to do something more family oriented at back to school time, just to show our presence in the community and encourage others to be kind. So thank you for everything. Amen. <laughs> All right, men come now, if you would, please, as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. And uh, it was a joy uh, to see how much was raised for um, the, the Be Kind Rewind ministry. We're glad to be part of that, $800. Uh, we'll, Lord willing, help you go a long ways, but we want to continue to do that. And uh, now, uh, Scott mentioned, we, we actually gave it a name next Sunday night. It's not just Dr. Charles Shoemaker. It's Super Sunday. We're calling it Super Sunday. Um, and uh, uh, Sunday morning, normal services. But Dr. Shoemaker is actually coming from Cincinnati next week, which is why he's only able to come in the evening. Uh, we are really looking forward to this. And uh, when he asked several months ago uh, if we could have a service, absolutely, we don't normally have Sunday night services, uh, but we really want to encourage you to come. I want to really urge you, church, come next Sunday. Uh, be here in the morning, 10 o'clock, growth class 1115, and then come back at 5 o'clock, uh, and uh, we'll have a great service, worship in the, uh, the beginning part, and then Dr. Shoemaker, and then his grandson plays fluently uh, violin and trumpet. We're going to have a special uh, by him as well. So it's going to be a great, uh, great event uh, next Sunday night. Uh, and then after that, dessert social. Uh, so you can, uh, you can, uh, I did that for dramatic effect. Uh, <laughs> Mike Tro that was a Mike Trock moment right there. Uh, but we'll look forward to a great, um, a great event. Uh, and then uh, snow cones as well. So you bring your own dessert if you'd like to share. Uh, we'll have a great time uh, next Sunday. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, and let me turn this back on again. All right. Did I break it? Okay. Jeff, if you have the Lord's blessings on the offering. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, just so very thankful to be in your house this morning, Lord. Uh, thankful for the message. Lord, we're thankful for the, the, the souls that came to know yes. you this week at VBS. And Lord, we just give you all the glory for that. And Lord, we just uh, ask that you would uh, bless the offering as it's taken up. Uh, bless the next hour. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It may not be in there this week, but this week is life groups. So if your group is meeting, I know there's a holiday, you may not be meeting. But if they are meeting without the holiday, that's great. Uh, I know Pastor said his is meeting tonight. So if you uh, still like to show up, show up tonight and you can join part of his. The next big thing with our, our study, we've been going through Simply Thriving. The book we passed out on Father's Day, the Praying the Bible, we will start this next week. If you don't have a book and you would like to purchase one, uh, see Anita. It's five dollars. Uh, don't let the money hold you back. It's a great book. It's a great way of learning how to pray. And we will start doing this as a group starting next week. So we'd like to encourage you start reading it. Uh, the first four chapters will be talked about next Sunday. Uh, maybe you're the type of person that says I don't like reading. Luckily, if you go on to Audible, you can listen to it for free. So. Even if you don't want to read, I like highlighting, I like underlining, I like making notes. I've got an addiction. I know it's a problem. But if you are fine, just maybe on your way to work, we'd encourage everybody to read so you know what we're going to be talking about. 
it would be great to start implementing this so you understand as we're talking and so you can talk about your experience and how God has changed your life through prayer. Our last thing, uh, we have the back to school event, July 30th. So with this, same thing as last year, we're gonna have a family oriented Sunday. We'll have someone come up from Cool Kids Ministries. He will preach the gospel yet be able to grab everybody's attention. So we have that coming up on the 30th. We will start talking about how we wanna reach out to our community. Uh, so show up and we'll be passing more information out over the next few weeks. So let's go ahead and pray and then we'll have our growth class showing up uh, starting shortly. God, thank you for just your word and that we can look and see so many truths of how we should treat our family, our wives. God, thank you for that process of sanctification that you've given us an identity before we ever had it. You say we are holy and we should become more holy because you are holy. God, thank you for chiseling away the old man and continue making us more like your image to glorify you. God, over the, the next few weeks, continue working on our hearts, working on how we can show love to others, our patience, and our understanding. In your name, amen.